Hello everyone, today we'll be discussing Late Antiquity and Byzantium. Late Antiquity is just a term that's used to describe the later part of the Roman Empire. So if you'll remember from the last module we were talking about ancient Rome. So here's the capital of uh, ancient Rome, which was Rome itself. Now Constantine, he changed the official religion of the Roman Empire from a polytheistic one to a monotheistic one, namely Christianity. And he also moved the location of the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome all the way over to the east to uh, what is recognized today as um, present-day Istanbul, uh, but during this time was called Constantinople and is in Turkey. With this shift, we see an incredible cultural shift, but we can't truly discuss it without first reviewing the three monotheistic religions that mark the artwork of this module. They are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. When discussing these three religions, I think we often forget how much they all have in common, but let's review. To begin with, all three are monotheistic, meaning that uh, uh, practitioners of the, these religions only recognize one god. All of these religions recognize Abraham as their first prophet. They uh, developed in the Middle East. Now, of these three, Judaism is the oldest, and Christianity and Islam build upon the beliefs of Judaism. As I mentioned, uh, Judaism is the oldest surviving monotheistic religion. If there was a monotheistic religion older than it, uh, we, we know nothing of it. Jews, as practitioners of Judaism are called, believe in one God, and they also recognize his prophets. Uh, the two most important Jewish prophets are Moses and Abraham. Um, Jewish faith emphasizes action. So in the Jewish holy books, there are uh, many rituals that, and guidelines that must be followed. Uh, for example, the laws that um, determine kosher are an example of Jewish laws. The two holiest Jewish books are the Torah, also known as the Pentateuch, um, which is included in the book that's referred to as the Old Testament by Christians. And then also the Talmud, which is a commentary on the Torah. Unlike Muslims and Christians, Jews do not recognize any prophets after the time of the prophets that are listed in the Torah. So they do not believe that uh, Jesus or Muhammad are true prophets. And the menorah on the bottom is an important religious Jewish symbol, which we see in a lot of the artwork of this time period. Christianity started as a, an offshoot of Judaism around the first century CE and the Christian holy book is referred to as the Bible. It's made of uh, the Old Testament which includes the Jewish Torah and the New Testament which was written by followers of Jesus sometime after his death. Christians believe that Jesus Christ was a prophet sent, sent by God um, and Jesus Christ, uh, from what we can tell, was a member of the Jewish community in Roman uh, Palestine. Uh, Christians believe him to be divine. The Christians, uh, Christian faith doesn't recognize the laws that are listed in the Jewish Torah. Uh, they, they are still contained within the book, but Christians believe that the law was overturned by the coming of Christ. And unlike Muslims, Christians do not believe that Muhammad was a true prophet. So Islam uh, is an offshoot of both uh, Judaism and Christianity, and it arose much later in the 7th century in Mecca, which is in current-day Saudi Arabia. Muslims believe that God, who they refer to as Allah, uh, sent a holy revelation in the form of a book called the Quran to a prophet named Muhammad in the 7th century. Uh, the, Qur the Quran is the holiest Islamic book and uh, it contains verses in Arabic that explain how best to worship God. Uh, Muslims believe that both Christianity 
and Judaism contain some version of the truth, but they are earlier versions, and that the Quran is the updated version of God's word, so to speak. Some of the earliest Christian and Jewish artwork that we see is found in ancient Rome, but much of it is found underground in catacombs. Because Christians and Jews were monotheistic, they were persecuted during much of the Roman Empire and put to death because it was against the law to worship only one god. So this here is a scene from the catacombs uh, below Rome where early Christians and Jews were buried and in it we can see early Christian iconography um, depicted and uh, starting to be perfected. I've starred this figure on the left, Christ is the Good Shepherd, because it's one of the earliest freestanding figures of Christ and it comes from the Roman Empire. It's interesting to see that early Christians were borrowing some of the style of statuary from the Roman Empire and turning it into Christian artwork. Uh, since the, the Roman Empire up until the rule of Constantine actually persecuted Christians. And we can see on the right another um, statue of Christ which is far more uh, like what we associate with Christian statuary. It's, it's um, seated and it's more static, although the attention to drapery again speaks of the influence of the Roman Empire. I want you to know this term, basilica. A basilica is typically a building that's just incredibly large and has a rectangular plan and uh, the basilica form was first used in the Roman Empire to create large marketplaces, but it was then adopted to create uh, enormous churches. So the rectangular um, layout of the building was then uh, slightly modified so that it, it almost appears to be a cross when you look at it aerially. And the um, earliest large-scale Christian churches that we have record of were built with a basilica plan. So this here is a restored view of what old St. Peter's in Rome would have looked like in the 300s. Moving forward, we're going to look at some artwork that um, was made by rulers following the rule of Constantine. Much of the artwork that we are going to look at, you'll notice, is incredibly stylized. A lot of it is done in mosaic. And mosaic, if you haven't heard of this term before, is a method of creating images in which tiny pieces of glass or stone uh, or any other material are used uh, and carefully pieced together to create a larger image, usually on a wall within a building, like this one here. So images like this w were placed within churches and oftentimes real gold was used so that in the light they appeared to shimmer. Let's look at some artwork from Byzantium. When I say Byzantium, I mean Constantinople and I also mean Istanbul. Anytime you hear the word Byzantine, it refers to the art territory, history, and culture of the Eastern Christian Empire and its capital of Constantinople, which is also known as Byzantium and Istanbul. And all of these are different names for the same city in modern-day Turkey. So when I refer to Byzantine art, it can refer to artwork that's not only from Byzantium, but also from this time period. However, when you hear the term Byzantium, it refers to the actual place. I know it's a little confusing, so here's a map again, don't get confused. This here is Byzantium. Byzantium is the old name for Constantinople slash Istanbul, but artwork that's called Byzantine could be from anywhere within the Byzantine Empire. The most important example of Byzantine artwork is this here. This is the Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia means holy wisdom in Greek, 
and when it was first constructed in the 500s, it was constructed as a Greek Orthodox Christian church. What is so remarkable about it is its use of domes. Uh, it's built with dome over dome over dome so that it appears to be floating. These minarets along the edge of it are a later addition. Uh, they were added when Hagia Sophia was later used as a mosque. However, it was first constructed as a Christian building. It's through the use of pendentives and squinches to architectural... Um, hmm, wow, I totally forgot the word. <laughs> Uh, two architectural forms which were used to support the domes so that the entire space seems as though it's being lifted up towards the heavens. What's interesting about this church is that we see that the idea of the divine is hardly um, exercised through the interior decoration. It's the architecture itself that is supposed to speak of the idea of divinity. It's almost like an abstraction of the idea of divinity. You can get a better sense of it when you see this image of what it would be like to actually enter into the church. Even though the building is incredibly large, it feels airy, like it might just lift up into the sky at any moment. That's also due to all of the windows that, that pierce every part of every dome. So there would have been light streaming into this building, much different than many other buildings built during this time period, which were quite dark. This is truly an architectural marvel. If you look at it today, you'll see the um, long history of its different uses. Today, Hagia Sophia is a museum. When it was first constructed, it was a church, and then it was later a mosque. It also burned down um, several times throughout history and has been rebuilt but rebuilt following original plans. The Great Iconoclasm was a imp very important historical event that took place during this time period uh, from 726 to 843. Um, some of you may be familiar with this here. This is from the book of Exodus, which is uh, a book in the Bible. And in this book it says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. This is one of the commandments listed in uh, the Ten Commandments. If you read this literally, I think you'll agree that this commandment is um, trying to tell all practitioners of Christianity that they should not make any images whatsoever. During this time period, um, scholars, philosophical thinkers, and Christians in general were very worried by this um, commandment, and there came within the church what was called the Great Iconoclasm, which was basically uh, there the church became divided between people who read this literally and believed that all images should be banned, uh, these people were called iconoclasts because they destroyed icons. Icon just means image in Greek. And then there were the people that believed that icons should not be destroyed and that the commandment needn't be read so literally. They were called iconophiles. These two groups battled um, and as a result very little artwork remains of this time period that is figurative. Most artwork that we have from this time period and uh, this region is all very abstract or symbolic. This is one of the few surviving examples um, because artwork was actually destroyed in churches and was removed from public spaces. A small image like this would have been made in private and worshipped in secret lest it be destroyed and the people who had it be um, punished or maybe even killed. I think it's incredible to imagine a time period where images were um, considered so dangerous that they had to be destroyed since we now live in a society that's so overloaded with images all the time. 
The Empress Isadora uplifted this ban on images, and among the first images that we see created uh, after the great iconoclasm reached its end is this here, which is a mosaic in the Church of Hagia Sophia, and it depicts the Virgin and Child. You'll see, however, that the Virgin and Child are very stylized, and there's a lot of stiffness about the way that they're drawn. There was still, I think, a lot of ambiguity and um, turmoil and anxiety over the creation of images. I include here at the end of this lecture just two, uh, two images basically because I really like them. They are both images from, um, from uh, manuscripts. Manuscript is simply a handmade book. These books were usually made on parchment, which is animal leather, and they were always hand-painted and uh, handwritten. This here is a fairly early example from Syria. It's from the 500s, and we see in it the ascension of Christ, but with interesting iconography of different types of angels. My favorite here is this angel whose wings are covered in eyes. And then I'll end with this one here. This is from the Paris Psalter, and the Psalter is a book of Psalms, which is a Christian book uh, that is supposed to lead Christians in prayer. However, you'll see, interestingly enough, that the figures in it and even the way the animals are drawn are very reminiscent of ancient Roman artwork, showing that uh, despite uh, all of the, the various things that happened through history, that really strong influence of ancient Rome never truly fades. And that concludes this lecture.